Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this AdSet webinar. My name is Gabrielle O'Brien and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the Senior Project Officer for AdSet, which stands for the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training. This webinar is being live captioned by Sharon from Bradley Reporting. Jane will put a link in for live captions in the chat as we are having a few technical issues. ADSET is hosted by the University of Tasmania, and so I would like to acknowledge the Palawa and Pakana people of Lutrawitra. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Turrbal and the Agra people in Mianjin or Brisbane. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging on both these lands and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here, and I acknowledge their ongoing connection to country, land and sea. Feel free to put what country you are on in the chat and to share where you are. And if you would like to put your pronouns in your profile, please also feel free. Um, before we begin, just some minor housekeeping information. Please ensure your mic is off and phones are on silent. This webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available on the AdSet website, website in the current days, and we will also include copies of the slide presentation. Throughout this presentation, feel free to use the chat box with us and each other, but please remember to choose everyone if you want everyone to read what you have to say. Uh, if you have a question you would like to put to Jax today, please use the Q&A box. And if you're having any technical difficulties, please email admin at adset.edu.au. So now I want to introduce our presenter for today. I'm very pleased to present um, Jax, Jackie Brown, whose preferred name is Jax and whose pronouns are they, them. Jax is coming to us from Melbourne, Wurundjeri country. In today's webinar, Jack, Jax is tackling the topic of affirming LGBTIQA plus people with disability. Jax will bring their lived experience and professional expertise to this topic to explore the experiences of LGBTIQA people with disability and how we as practitioners and humans can be more inclusive. So thank you, Jax, for your time today and I'll now hand over to you. Thank you and what a pleasure it is to be with you this afternoon. Um, I'll be talking about affirming LGBTIQA plus people with disabilities, um, how you can be supportive and affirming when working with us. And I'll be talking for about the next 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So please put your questions in the Q&A box if something occurs to you as we move through my presentation. Um, I would love to hear from you. Um, if I don't get through all the questions or if there was something that you would like to ask me one-on-one -on -one at a later time, I'll be also providing my contact details at the end as well. And I'm really open to that conversation. So my name is Jax and I've been working in the LGBTIQA plus disability rights space um, as an activist and as an educator. And I'll introduce myself more in the moment, but first I want to, um, I want to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend my respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us this afternoon. This land was never ceded and the process of colonization, occupation, incarceration and genocide that began over two centuries ago continues to this day. In the face of this though, I wanna recognize the strength, resilience and pride of the First Nations people of this land. Um, the artwork that you can see on your screen is by uh, artist called Peter Waffles Crow, who is a Nauragoo man from the high country of New South Wales, and he also has Wurundjeri connections as well. Peter lives and works on Nam, also known as Melbourne, and he's gay, and this work that he's made a couple of years ago speaks to his feelings and his experiences of being part of a group, but also feeling on the outer of another group because of his multiple identities. He says, I'm inside culture because I'm Aboriginal. 
I'm outside because I'm gay. I'm inside gay culture because I'm gay and I'm outside because I'm Aboriginal. And I really encourage you to look him up and, and look up his artwork as well. He's an amazing human. Um, I wanna take a moment to pay deep respect to the First Peoples Disability Network Australia, which is an organization run by and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with disabilities. <coughs> and I encourage you to look them up and to find ways you can support the important work that they're doing. So who am I? Well, I am a parent. I am a performer. I do some performance poetry as well as public speaking and workshops. Um, I'm a friend and I'm a partner. Um, and there's a variety of images on the screen of me um, with some friends, me holding my child on my lap, my four-year-old on my lap in my power wheelchair um, and me with my partner as well. Um, so a quick visual description of me. I'm a white person with short dark hair and glasses and I'm wearing a button up shirt with um, tiny uh, green cactuses on it. I'm also wearing black jeans um, and boots with rainbow laces, but you can't see those. And I'm seated in my manual wheelchair. My pronouns, as we said at the beginning, are they and them. Um, and as you can see from the images on your screen, I'm a lot of different things. I'm a queer person, I'm non-binary, and I use two different types of wheelchairs. So I use my manual wheelchair um, and also a power wheelchair. And these two different types of chairs really influence how I'm perceived when I'm out and about and how I'm related to by other people and also the different access to spaces that I have depending on what chair I'm using. Um, I'm also dyslexic and you'll notice that I'm looking across to the side today. That's because I'm reading some notes to keep myself to time, um, but reading is hard for my brain. So I'll do my best to um, read what I've written, but I hope that we can create a space here in the next hour together that is disability affirming. And by that, I mean that we can create a space where we feel um, that it's a safe space to talk about our disabilities openly and to talk about our access needs. Um, I'm probably gonna cough a little bit in this presentation and my apologies. Um, I've had COVID recently and I'm, I'm still recovering. So um, yeah, my apologies for that, but I'll do my best. Being disabled, queer and non-binary are all super important parts of my identities, as well as being an activist, a parent, a partner, and a friend. I've worked in the LGBTIQA plus disability rights space for over 10 years, and I'm passionate about disability rights and LGBTIQA plus rights. And I'm really committed to social justice and to playing my small part in the bigger struggle. I was awarded a Medal of the Order of Australia last year for my work in the LGBTIQA plus disability rights space. And when I got that award, I felt really conflicted about it. It feels really strange to have the colonial nation state recognize my activism and give it value in some way by, by giving me that award. Um, but I chose to accept it and I chose to accept it in part because I, I want to use the power that it brings to trouble that power, to trouble that, um, that space of who gets to hold power and how and who's exclu excluded from um, different spaces and places because of our marginality. So I often use the OAM after my name to open doors for other marginalized people, to get them into spaces that they wouldn't get into um, if I hadn't perhaps given a, a letter of reference or put my name forward um, in the advance of their work as well. Um, just a quick note on language. So I'll be using the term disabled in my talk and I'm doing so really deliberately in the context of the social model of disability. And under the social model, disabled comes to mean a form of oppression or disadvantage because of ableism. So in this context, disabled is a political term. 
Um, and I'm also aware that I'm using the term intersectionality and I'm using it as a white person. And I really want to acknowledge its history and that it was first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, an African-American woman in the 1980s, as a way to think about racism and sexism and how they intersect or overlap in the lives of black women. At its core, intersectionality is a political term and it asks us to think about systemic inequality, power and privilege, and how we must address these things. So there's a picture on screen of me um, as a, a five-year-old with my crutches at the time in our backyard um, in suburban New South Wales, where I grew up. Um, and growing up, I wasn't expected to have a job, a long-term partner or a child. My parents didn't really have a vision of my life where I could achieve things or aspire to the things that other non-disabled people could. And this was largely because the doctors and the specialists that we interacted with on a weekly basis were really stuck in this negative deficit view of disability. And also that my parents didn't seek out other adults with disability for me to feel connected to. My disabilities, however, were never gonna go away. They were never gonna disappear, no matter how many surgeries or therapies my body was subjected to. And this elusive idea of normal in inverted commas, which is also a social construct, was not something that I could ever attain. And yet I was pro not provided with any positive way to think about my disabilities growing up. The narrative I heard over and over again was that I was special and brave and that I would overcome my limitations. And the idea that I would learn, that I would have to learn to live with this body as it is and that disability would remain and that it could become something I could feel proud of and find an identity and community because of was not something anyone ever said to me as a young person. The influence of the medical profession, of doctors, of specialists, of physiotherapists, of occupational therapists, in shaping how I and other people with disabilities view ourselves is massive. Whether you're born with a disability or you acquire your disability at some point in your life. The medical model of disability remains the dominant way of thinking about disability in Western society. Under this model, a person's impairment or condition is the problem. Disability is to be cured or minimized. Disabled people are seen as less than or flawed or in need of help or pity. And from this model comes ideas of special services for special people like special schools, which I'm a survivor of, or segregated employment and group homes as well as many more. The medical discourse positions the sexuality of people with disabilities as abnormal, defective, deviant, as something to be policed or controlled. The cost of this approach on me was that I spent many years feeling exiled from my body, disconnected from other disabled people and the disability community. The medical profession and the medical model shapes how we see our bodies, how we learn to view them as less than non-disabled people, as bad or unworthy of love. This model does the opposite of allowing us to feel disability pride. And we hold these histories of shame in our bodies. So how did I move from this shame to a space of pride? Um, there's an image on your screen of a bunch of um, people with disabilities under a banner that says injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, which is a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and it's an image from the disability rights movement in the US in the 1980s. Well, I moved towards pride by in my early 20s, being connected to and becoming friends with another disabled person who was living a few streets away from me in my small regional country town in New South Wales. 
And through this connection that we were both able to start reading books about disability history and discussing our bodies and lives in new and exciting ways. And I was lucky enough to stumble across a few books on disability rights and the disability rights movement, which showed me that disabled people were not passive or to be pitied, but that we have a long and vibrant history of activism and advocacy, of fighting for our rights together. The social model of disability arose in the UK in the 1980s. Social barriers and attitudes disable people, not their bodies and minds being non-normative. And as I said, under the social model, disabled or disabled people is a political term and disability becomes an identity. The social model enabled me to no longer view myself and my body as a problem, but to see disability as a socio-political question, a question of access, identity, and of human rights. I came to understand that many of the barriers that I was facing as a wheelchair user weren't because my body was wrong, but because the environment had been built to be inaccessible and also that people held, either consciously or unconsciously, many outdated prejudices and stereotypes about disability. The idea that disability is socially created was really transformative in how I saw my body and how I saw the world around me and also how I felt about other disabled people. So now there's an image on screen of me at a protest earlier this year in Melbourne in March um, that was defending the cuts to the NDIS under the previous government. Um, being connected to other disabled people, and again, I use the term disabled here politically to describe how we've been disabled and disadvantaged by an inaccessible society and attitudes. Being connected to other disabled people has and continues to be central to me feeling and practicing my disability pride. There is a long and vibrant history of people with disabilities fighting for our rights in Australia and internationally. Understanding that I'm not alone in coming up against some of this discrimination and barriers that I continue to face, and that I'm part of a movement which is fighting for our human rights, gives me a sense of connection, resilience, and pride. Um, so there's an image on your screen, a black and white image of um, UK artist and activist Liz Crow, and she's seated in her manual wheelchair and she's wearing a t-shirt that says disability pride um, and she's on some kind of stage or scaffolding um, and there's a quote which is on screen as well which says which is by Liz which says for many years now the social model of disability has enabled me to confront survive and even surmount countless situations of exclusion and discrimination it has enabled a vision of ourselves, free, free from the constraints of disability oppression and provided a direction for our commitment to social change. It has played a central role in promoting disabled people's individual self-worth, collective identity and political organisation. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that the social model has saved lives. Now, by highlighting the value of the social model in my life and in the lives of other disabled people, it's not to dismiss or downplay the whiteness of the disability rights movement historically and today. It also needs to be acknowledged that the movement has dismissed cisgender, cisgendered women and feminist concerns of the gendered nature of their oppression. Disability feminists were actively told by the leaders of the disability rights movement that to bring up their concerns around their bodily experience of disability, for example, the experience of pain, to talk about their intimate lives, sexuality and reproductive rights were personal issues. And that airing such issues publicly would confuse non-disabled people. And they would again think that disability was a personal issue and not a political issue. 
But as we know, the personal is political. However, for many people with disabilities, talking about their intimate lives and the barriers they face in terms of their sexuality and gender expression can be hard because without a political lens, it's easy to internalize the ableism you're encountering and to think that you're the problem. For me, engaging in disability rights as a queer person and then later coming out as non-binary, I've realized that much of the disability activist space is very heterosexual, very cisgender, and that it hasn't been very welcoming to me or other LGBTIQA plus people. At times, it's even been hostile and transphobic. And look, part of these reactions, I think, from disabled folks is due to the internalized ableism they're experiencing. The pressure to try and fit in, to not be more different than you already are. So they see many LGBTIQA plus disabled people as pushing the boundaries too much. The same can be said, unfortunately, for the LGBTI. QA plus community and their responses to folks with disabilities. In that ableism is present in these spaces too. Even though as queer and trans people, we can think radically about gender, power, bodies and sexuality. Too often people think folks with disabilities don't belong in these spaces and we continue to be excluded. We can't get in to many of the bars and clubs and so we're just not there, we're just not visible. And because we're not visible, we're not thought of as potential lovers, as partners, as even a possible hot hash on a Saturday night. Speaking of hot pashes, here's a hot pash for you all to keep your attention. Um, and because it's well hot, and I like to add a bit of sauciness to my presentation. Um, so this picture was taken over eight years ago now when I was in the first few months of my relationship with my partner, Anne. And it's at that time in a relationship, I'm sure you've all been there, um, where you're really in lust with each other and you just can't keep your hands off each other. Um, and I wrote a little article um, for a sexuality mag down here in, um, in Melbourne called Archer. And if you haven't heard of Archer, you could ch should check it out. They just did a disability issue um, last year in December, which just won an award because it was so amazing. Anyway, I wrote um, this article called The Politics of Pashing. And it was about how pashing my girlfriend in public was a political act because we rarely see disabled queer people in popular culture, on TV, in books, in film. And the editor rang me up and said, look, I'd really love to take some photos um, to accompany your article. And I said to my girlfriend, do you want to come and patch me around the streets and we'll have a photographer take some snaps? And she said, sure. Um, and so we went um, into Melbourne in the CBD on a busy Saturday morning um, and, and took this and a bunch of other photos. Um, and look, I really love this image. I love it because it captures that time in our relationship um, before we had a child and when we had much more time to patch about the place. Um, so it captures, you know, that, that um, initial stage of our relationship. But I also love it because for me, it's an image that I wish I'd seen as a young queer disabled person growing up. It's an image that says to me, you are lovable, you are desired just as you are, not in spite of your disability, not trying to minimize your disability, but you're loved and desired for all that you are with your disability included as a central part of that. We never see images like this in our media or on our streets. We never see our bodies depicted as desired, as lovable and as valued. Um, there's a quote on the screen by writer and educator Anne Finger that says, sexuality is often the source of our deepest oppression. It's often the source of our deepest pain. It's easier for us to talk about and formulate strategies for challenging discrimination in employment, education and housing than to talk about our exclusion from sexuality and reproduction. As I've outlined, the disability rights movement has historically and still today struggled to include sexuality rights in, in its understanding 
of the disadvantages we as disabled people face. This quote and the work of other disabled people challenges that erasure. However, gender identity for trans and gender diverse folks is rarely even considered by the disability rights movement. And this along with the experience of First Nations people with disabilities are the new frontiers for disability activism and advocacy. Um, so there's an image on your screen of Alison Lapper, a UK artist, um, and it's a massive marble statue, um, which was in Trafalgar Square uh, in 2005. Um, and it's of her when she was pregnant with her son at the time, and she was born missing an arm and a leg. Um, so it's, this image is an image I also think that we rarely see of disabled people. And that's one of us um, being pregnant or birthing and parenting children. So as we look at this image, I want you to think about who is considered the default body or mind when we think about reproductive rights, when we think about pregnancy, birthing and parenting. The image that often springs to mind is of non-disabled people. It's of cisgendered people i.e. people who aren't transgender, and it's often of white people. Who is allowed to become a parent and whose reproductive choices are limited, controlled or judged? Often people with disabilities are not given the opportunities to enact our reproductive choices. Cis women with intellectual disabilities are routinely put on birth control as a means of preventing them from getting pregnant and have less opportunities to form relationships and to start a family because of ableist assumptions and attitudes. <clears throat> In Michael Gill's seminal work called Already Doing It, Intellectual Disability and Sexual Agency, he notes individuals with intellectual disabilities, sexual needs were ignored. Their sexual behavior was punished and they were randomly sterilized. They were closeted in their homes or isolated in large institutions, segregated by sex to prevent them from reproducing. In fact, they were actually oppressed largely because of their sexuality. Gendered assumptions around mothering impact cis women with disabilities, where it's presumed that in order to be a good mother, you need to be able to care for your child completely independently and without the need to use assistance such as from support workers. Reproductive rights and the choice of whether or not to have children, finding a partner to do that with or going it solo um, as a parent, these choices are often denied for people with disabilities. And they're often denied by the very people in our lives who are meant to support us parents, support workers, service providers continue to gatekeep and manage our access to sexual health knowledge and limit our access to events, pubs and bars where we might form relationships and explore our sexuality. And for LGBTIQA plus people with disabilities, we face additional challenges. And here's another quote from Gill, which says, gay men, lesbians, gender queer and gender non-conforming persons, racial minority populations, poor people, disabled people are often discouraged to reproduce for fear that they cannot, will not, or should not contribute to the future of the human race. The idea that disabled people will create disabled babies should we reproduce is deeply ableist. It holds at its core the idea that disability is inherently a bad thing, that disabled people will make bad parents. And we know this is not true. And here's another quote. Robert McEwen, however, argues that queer crit perspectives can challenge assumptions about which bodies are able to inhabit and lay claim to normative conceptions of agency, family, and ultimately identity. We deliberately trouble notions of who is permitted to be sexual and how, 
who is worthy of love and connection of value. Disability is part of human variation. It's an aspect of diversity, but it's rarely thought about in those terms. I don't wanna change my body or brain. I wanna change society, for it's society and people's attitudes that disable me. I wanna challenge ableism, including sexual ableism. So let's briefly explore some of the challenges for LGBTIQA plus people with disabilities in Australia. <clears throat> we know that LGBTIQA plus people with disabilities experience higher rates of violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. With a recent writing themselves in report looking at the health and well-being of LGBTIQA plus young people in Australia, finding that in the last 12 months, LGBTIQA plus people with disabilities have experienced the following rates of harassment or assault based on their sexuality or gender identity. 52.7% have experienced verbal abuse, 15% physical abuse, and 31.7% sexual abuse. And it's worth noting that although this report was published in 2021, the survey responses were provided in 2019. So it'd be really interesting to know that the impact of living through the COVID-19 pandemic had on LGBTIQA plus people's experiences of mental health and experiences of violence. And I would suspect, given um, the other evidence that we know in terms of the impact of the pandemic, that those rates would sadly have increased <laughs> across this time. Um, the Disability Royal Commission, which is occurring now, has had some closed sessions with LGBTIQA plus people with disabilities, looking into our experiences. And they found what many of us have already known in our lives, that we're subject to intersecting and overlapping forms of disadvantage. We know that, as I've said, family members and support workers, those very people who should be supporting us to be our full selves, are often not affirming our identities. And this is a real issue when we might need support to go to LGBTIQA plus events, when we might need support to buy clothes and dress in ways that affirm and express our gender identity. The NDIS is a massive system, which only 10% of people with disabilities in Australia have access to. But for those of us who do have access to it, it's a key way that we're able to meet our basic support needs. But sadly, the NDIS is not LGBTIQA plus responsive. From local area coordinators, to the planners who help you write your plan, to the support workers you have in your life, all these people often lack knowledge of LGBTIQA plus issues and identities, leaving many people to feel unsupported and even unsafe to disclose their sexuality or their gender identity. <coughs> So let's now um, explore some practical ways that you can be supportive and affirming um, of LGBTQA plus people with disabilities. So pronouns are really an important way to let people know your gender identity and how you want people to talk about you. Using someone's pronouns signals to them, especially if they're trans or gender diverse, that you respect and affirm their gender identity. So on the slide, there's some gendered pronouns, which are he, him, or his, and she, her, or hers. And there's some gendered neutral pronouns, they, them, or theirs, or ze, zia, or zias. Um, and these gender neutral pronouns are often used by non-binary non -binary or gender fluid folks. A person's pronouns may change over time. Someone might use she or they pronouns now, but might use they or them in the future, or they might use a combination of pronouns. So they might use she in particular contexts and they in other contexts where they're more out or feel more supported to do so. So it's really best practice to check in with the person if you're unsure about what pronouns they're using. And a really easy way to start doing that is to get into the habit of introducing yourself with your pronouns. So saying, hi, my name is, 
And my pronouns are, can I ask what your pronouns are? Um, another way to signal that you are thinking about pronouns and wanting to be inclusive is to include them in your email signatures beside your name in Zoom or Teams and wear a pronoun badge when you're at work. Um, here is a, um, another list of ways that you can be affirming. Um, it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, I'm, I would love to hear your comments or questions um, on additional things that you think are important as well. Um, an important one though, I think, and at the very top there, is to know that gender is not a binary, but it's a spectrum. So with a spectrum with female being at one end and male being up the other end, and people might move along that spectrum across their lifespan. Um, another thing is that 80% of disabilities are invisible. So when we think about what disability looks like, we often think about a wheelchair user or someone with a visible disability, but it's much more common for people to have invisible disabilities. So we really need to create a culture whether that's in an educational context or a work context or a broader societal context where people feel safe and respected to talk about their disabilities, where they feel safe to disclose these things. Um, also being across the different um, important days of significance is really a key way of signaling that you're supportive and finding ways that you can celebrate them in your workplace um, you know, at your place of education, um, even with your friend group, they're, they're important things to be um, across and to find out ways of marking those days. Um, also, forms are really important. Um, having a space where people can write their preferred name, um, if their legal name and preferred name are different, um, is really key. And having an open text box for gender. So people can write in their gender identity in the language that's most affirming for them. Um, and maintaining confidentiality. So just because someone's told you what their pronouns are or what their sexuality is, um, you know, treating that with respect and confidentiality. So they might have only told you because they trust you and they feel connected to you. So making sure that you don't share that information with other people. Um, checking in directly with people about what their pronouns are and what different contexts they would like you to use those pronouns in. And also if they've told you what their preferred name is, checking in about that as well. Because again, they might've trusted you with that information, but they mightn't have told the rest of the workplace. They mightn't have told their friends yet or their parents if they're still living at home, if they're a young person. So really, having direct conversations with the people that you're connected in with about this stuff is really important. Um, uh, also, if you make a mistake and you misgender someone, if you use the wrong pronoun for someone, um, apologize, pick up on your mistake, say, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, I'll try and do better next time. Um, don't go into a shame spiral about it. Don't turn it into a massive thing because then that person who you've misgendered feels like they need to hold that space for you. Um, just apologize, say I'm really sorry and, and try and do better next time. Um, don't make assumptions based on um, how someone's voice sounds or how they look as to what their gender identity might be. So really um, listening to what the person is telling you around what their pronouns are, what their name is, um, and respecting that and mirroring that back to that person is a really important thing to do and really affirming. Um, and the last one on the slide there, invest in LGBTIQA+, disability, First Nations, cold trainings, which are designed and delivered by people with lived experience. Um, and don't just have this training as a one-off, but thinking about how you can embed it in your organisation um, so that people who may start in your organisation um, are also getting access to this training and this knowledge and people who've been there for a while are getting a refresher in some of this stuff. Um, and I think it's really important to have these trainings 
um, be delivered and designed by people who live um, these experiences because then we can bring the richness and the complexity of our lives and the knowledges that we hold into these trainings to um, make it interesting and informative, but also to pay marginalised people for the work that we do in terms of educating um, and trying to create social change. Um, this is a quote by one of my favourite authors who's called Ela Clare. He's a trans, queer, disabled writer from the US. Um, he's written a bunch of poetry books, which you're, if you're a bit of a poet like I am, I really encourage you to check out. Um, he's also written a book called Beautiful Imperfection, um, which is a beautiful book about his uh, grappling with cure. So this idea of um, wanting to engage with the medical profession for pain management, for particular things around his disability, but also then holding a space of um, understanding a human rights perspective and a social model perspective on disability and how to kind of hold both those uh, frameworks or models in his understanding of his body and his activism. Um, and he also writes a lot on whiteness um, and how to, um, how to practice true allyship with people of color if you're a white person and environmental justice as well. Anyway, he's a beautiful writer and I encourage you to look him up and read some of his work. Um, but I've included a quote here, which I really love, which says, pride works in direct opposition to internalized oppression. The latter provides a fertile ground for shame, denial and self-hatred and fear. And the former encourages anger, strength and joy. To transform self-hatred into pride is a fundamental act of resistance. And I really love this quote because it shows the power of pride to shift how we feel about ourselves. And it shows how it can give us resilience when we encounter homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, or ableism. To many people, the idea of disability pride seems counterintuitive. How can you feel pride in something which is presumed to be inherently negative? Disability, it's often assumed, is just an experience of pain or the experience of isolation, abuse, or discrimination. It's assumed that the experience of disability gives us nothing of value, nothing positive. But that's wrong, and there's lots of good things about being disabled. And yes, I really want to acknowledge that pain and illness, sure as heck, are really hard to deal with, and they're really hard for me to deal with. But disability pride doesn't deny those experiences. But it says that how I experience my body and the barriers that I face and the hard things that I've gone through and the hard things that I'm probably going to go through um, are not my fault. And they're heavily influenced or impacted by the ableism that I also experience. My disability gives me access to a different experience of the world a different understanding of the way bodies and minds can be and the value found in being different from the supposed norm. My disability gives me a different perspective on gender and on power, as well as an access to a vibrant and feisty disability community and culture. Um, so I'm gonna to go to questions in a second. Uh, and I wanted to put up my contact details. Um, and there's two pride flags, which mean a lot to me on the screen. And the one on the left is the disability pride flag, which was a collaborative design effort by Anne Margul with the disability community. Um, and there's also the progress pride flag, which is the rainbow pride flag um, with the black and brown stripes added um, and pink and blue and white colors as well in the triangle to signify the inclusion of trans people and First Nations people and black and brown people of color. Um, so it's a relatively new pride flag, both of them are relatively new. Um, and it's about thinking about who are the most marginalized parts of the LGBTIQA plus community and how can we visually represent their inclusion in, in our pride flag. Um, so there's my contact details down there. 
Uh, if you have questions now, I'd really love to hear, hear, hear them. And as I said, if we don't have time, I will happily answer them uh, after this as well. But also, if you want to reach out to me, if you feel like I've said some stuff today and you would like to uh, read some more stuff on the experience of LGBTIQ plus people with disabilities, I'm a bit of a nerd for this stuff. So um, I can give you some reports to read, some journal articles to follow up on, um, some connection points into um, groups that are being run for our community, by our community. Um, but also if you have a question or you just want to touch base, but you don't want to ask it um, in a public forum such as this. I'm really open to hearing from you and to having that conversation one-on-one -on -one as well, because I know um, sometimes when I talk, it can bring up stuff for people. Um, and I would love to, to be able to be there and, and supportive of you um, and just connect in and to know what resonated as well would be nice. Um, so thanks so much for having me. Um, give this little presentation um, and now over to question time. Uh, here's a list of, um, not an extensive list, but a list of some resources. Um, the slide deck will also go up on the website when the uh, presentation is put up as well. So you have access to downloading this and following it up in your own time. Um, as well. Thanks, thanks, Jax. That was um, so powerful and some of the comments that have come through have also um, reinforced how um, powerful people have found this presentation. Uh, it's really important for us to have voices like yours to open our eyes and open doors for greater inclusion. Um, so we have had some questions about um, an expanded reading list that people would love to find out about and um, additional resources. So. We'll work with Jax to, to get some of those um, in, but we've also got some um, questions as well. Well, this first one is a comment really. Um, Jax, your reference to oppression where you're guided by the likes of Paolo, Free Rare, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, perhaps you could be um, for Rare advocating for the oppressed in our present day. So that's a, that's a lovely um, uh, compliment. And next question is, um, from Elizabeth, I worry that we have minimal representation happening in higher education classes. Whose voices and research are studied and who is omitted? Who is visually represented and who is omitted? How might we advocate or improve this in the higher education sector? Yeah, look, that's, that's a lovely question. Um, and I think for me, I, I loved university. I haven't gone on to, um, to uh, post um I've got my bachelor's um in cultural studies but haven't haven't gone on to honors um and look I think it's about uh providing students with disabilities those pathways that feel welcoming and accessible to them and meeting their access needs in terms of being able to provide additional support or longer time to complete tasks um and I know universities are already doing that work but I think sometimes particularly for folks with inter with um, invisible disabilities, that um, feeling like you might face barriers in disclosing that or, or getting reports or getting specialist support to um, have evidence around uh, why you might need extra time and what that looks like um, can be a bit of a barrier too. So thinking about that in terms of why people might pursue further study to be um, some of our lecturers and tutors but also providing opportunities for people with lived experience to come in and give guest lectures. I do some guest lectures for a variety of, of universities um, around Australia in disability and LGBTIQA plus stuff. Um, and so that can be another avenue of, <coughs> sorry, I've still got my COVID cough, um, of, of, giving, of giving voice to that, that lived experience and that lived um, expertise that people hold. Um, and really providing students with a capacity to see, you know, the marginalities that they might share with those people represented and valued by the university as well. Uh, great. Thanks, Jax. Um, and I, I think increasingly we're seeing more centres and research centres for research around gender 
um, studies and disability studies. So, so hopefully people can um, seek out those experts in their own institutions. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is around if we have an open field for gender, how do we respectfully question if we don't understand what is written? That is such a good question and I haven't had that question before. So good on you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I guess I guess it's about um, if you have, um, you know, if that's a client you're working with or a student that you're working with um, and, and you, you don't understand what they mean or what pronouns they might want you to use because they've they've um, defined their gender in a way that you haven't come across before. Um, you know, gently having that conversation and and asking that question about, um, oh, so I'm just wanting to know more about what this term means for you, um, you know, what pronouns you would like me to use. Um, and I think it, I think as I said, it comes from creating that space where you're um, talking about your pronouns and your gender as well so that they feel like you're thinking critically about it and you're positioning yourself within that um, within that relationship with them so they're not feeling singled out um, in that interaction so so yeah I think curious questions are okay um, and and this space of language whether it be the language around disability and how we refer to ourselves or the LGBTQA plus acronym and what all those letters mean and, and gender diversity and the different ways we might identify. These two communities are really shifting and changing and evolving really quickly in terms of um, the language that we're, we're choosing to use for ourselves um, and the questions we might have as communities around what is best practice language, for example. So it's okay to not always feel um, on top of it. It's okay to sometimes feel a little bit like you're trying to catch up, um, but but creating this space where you, you, you're being respectful, you're being open-hearted about it, and you're being curious um, in a way that's still supportive, um, I think are the key things for me. And some of the questions relate specifically to where people can find um you know, a, a list of pronouns. Do you have a like a, a go-to resource that you prefer if people want to question, um, want to find out which are the best um, resources on pronouns? Yes, I have an entire list, um, which I can provide. I probably can't pull up the document right this second. And no, that's that. okay. We'll get that. But after. I can provide it after the, the fact. There's a, there's a bunch of different ones. Um, I also, I've got a four-year-old, as you saw there, um, and I also have a list of um, children's books around disability and LGBTIQA plus or rainbow families, um, which I can also provide as well. I think one of the key ways that we can shift some of this stuff as a society is by, of course, you know, teaching the, the future generations to not be scared of difference. And one of the key ways we can do that, I think, is by having awesome books to read to the little people in our lives about different bodies and minds and identities. Um, and making it a conversation you can have with young people that doesn't feel, you know, out of your depth or scary or whatever. So I'm happy to provide that as well if it would be useful. And right, also I thanks. do agree with the comment in the chat, which is four-year-olds are the best. They are. <laughs> um, and so another question is um, uh, from Dexter. Thank you so much for recognising the whiteness of the LGBTIQA mm -hmm. plus movement as a queer of colour. It is extremely hard for me to have my voice out there. Can you please make a comment on how queer people are overrepresented in neurodiverse communities and the ableism of the queer communities? Yeah, yeah. Look, it's so true, isn't it? Hey, that that white people we hold way more privilege and power, and often don't don't examine that um, and don't make space for people that are more marginalised to really talk about the complexities of their voices and experiences and struggles um yeah look i think that in terms of the neurodiversity question there's been some emerging and interesting research done um, that's found that up to 60 percent of people who are neurodiverse are also trans or gender diverse so there's this really interesting emerging link between those two populations um, i know drum and street services who i used to work 
work for for a couple of years um, did a, an interesting study around that that came up with that 60% statistic. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a space that I would love to see more people with lived experience um, leading that research and doing co-design work around what it looks like and what services and supports trans and gender diverse people need who are neurodiverse and, and how, um, you know, how they can do some education of their schools, of their educational institutions, of their families of origin um, around what living at that intersection looks like and, and feels like for them. Thanks, Jax, that's great. Um, we've just got time for a couple more, I think. Um, I've got a couple of people from a, oh, New Zealand, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll pronounce it incorrectly if I try to say um, the Maori um, name, but they're after information on um, disability right groups in New Zealand and um, information on demographic data, but we might just um, keep that aside and, and mm. think about that a little bit um, later. So I don't want to ignore our um, our colleagues across the ditch, but that's a kind of a complex question to ask at this point. Um, but the final question I think is when people in areas don't seem to have a connection available, what is the first steps they could take to reach out and create some new group connections? Yeah, um, great question. I would say um, with the New Zealand question, Patsy Frawley, who um, used to um, work at Deakin for years and years in the Respectful Lives and Healthy Relationships program with people with intellectual disabilities um, who are co-researchers with her. She's moved to New Zealand now, so she would be a really good person to contact. I can't remember the name of the university she's currently working for, but she might be able to um, connect you in and answer some of those questions. Um, look, I mean, in terms of reaching out and finding those connections, I would say, um, social media sometimes is a great space for finding grassroots online groups that are run by and for LGBTIQA plus people or people with disabilities. Um, um, looking at what some of your large um, health organisations have in terms of information and support. So ACON, if you're in New South Wales, um, Drummond Street Services or Thorn Harbour Health, if you're in Victoria, um, not so much across the other states, I'm sorry. Um, but also then, of course, looking at the disability service providers um, and what they might be thinking about or offering in this space. Um, but I would I'd really kind of say, try and connect in with individuals who belong to the communities that you're trying to find out more about because they'll have the connection points um, into those kind of um, or, um, grassroots organisations or support groups that will then be able to provide you some, some kind of more tailored um, ways of finding out additional information. So like, I'm happy to be a, a conduit for that um, exploration. If you if that would be useful, you've got my email address. Um, if you want to email with, with more kind of detail around where you are and who you are and what you're looking for, I'm happy to try and find, find connection points. Oh, Jax, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, our ad tech groups are always very um, engaged. Um, so that's what we have time for in terms of questions today. So I'm sorry if we didn't get to all your questions, but we'll try and um, answer all of those offline. And when we put the information up on our um, website after the webinar, we'll be able to do that. Um, so just to finish off today, we've got some great webinars coming up, um, scaffolding students to become independent learners and career ready graduates. Jade's putting these in the um, chat now. And another one which will be really interesting to those people that wanted to find out a bit more inclusive language information, we're having a, another session that is specifically about developing inclusive language guides with a particular focus on LGBTIQA plus and people with disability. Um, so please look out for those those coming up. Um, we're always open to more suggestions about AdSet um, webinars. So don't be afraid to let us know what you'd like to see. Um, and we really do value your um, feedback about today's session. So we will um, add a link to the, um, the chat now to about um, a survey of how you felt about today. Uh, once again, thank you, Jax. That's been um, a fabulous um, presentation, really personal 
um, and thank you for opening up to, to all of our participants today. Um, and thank you to our live captioner as well, um, Sharon from Bradley Reporting. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. <laughs>